Hi, my name is Stephanie Cullen. I grew up in an alcoholic home. My father was an alcoholic, and uh, my mother, I was the child that she didn't want to have. I was about eight years old, I started being physically abused, so there was a lot of fear. I was left alone at times at night, and uh, you just never really knew what was going to happen. Just, you know, living with fear, basically. And uh, with that went uh, isolation. I did have friends, but you can never have friends over. So um, I just didn't have any uh, peace. I just grew up very fearful. I had actually married my high school sweetheart, and uh, he had, as we had been married a little while, he had, it became evident that he had alcohol and drug issues. He had three little kids, and he had beat me up really bad. As somebody that worked where I lived, he, um, a gardener, he shared the Lord with me. My mind was pretty shot from those years of, uh, I lived under that for about seven years, and my mind was pretty um, shot from that. But um, these people, these Christians, they loved me, and I prayed for salvation, even though I didn't really understand what it was. And they would tell me to, um, read the word and I would just read it out loud and it began to saturate in and uh, I began to feel a peace. I learned how to pray and uh, wow, the difference is between night and day. You know, before I could think clearly and my mind was getting healed through his word, the body of Christ loved me and, and they saw me through. You know, the peace of God that passes all understanding has come in my life. It's never been the same, and I know that He's always with me, no matter what I go through. Too many of you can relate with that story probably too, too deeply in the first part of the story, but I hope everyone here can relate with that last part of that story, that the power of Jesus and the power of God's grace to heal. Uh, we're talking today about peace. We're starting a three-week series on peace, and, and the question we want to ask is, can we find peace in the middle of a world that has lots of anxiety-producing experiences, where there's pain and there's loss and there's struggles and there's challenges? Can we find peace in the midst of all of that? And I think by watching Stephanie's testimony, it's kind of neat to know that Stephanie not only has become a follower of Jesus, but she's an active part of this congregation. She's now one of our leaders for our newly launched mental health support ministry. We have a new mental health support ministry that has just been launched. I think we're about two weeks into it, two meetings into it. And she's one of the leaders helping other people find God's healing and God's peace in the midst of really difficult times. She's also part of our a new developing women's jail ministry. We have two women's jail ministry teams that are just getting ready to launch that new ministry and here you see a person who's experiencing what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, blessed be the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions so we can in turn comfort others with the comfort we receive from God. Whatever their affliction is, God can use us. That's, that's good news. But, but it's, there's pain and there's struggle in this world, in this life. We're talking about anxiety and worry and they don't seem to be going away. Uh, statistics, and, 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 and I, I had Ramel, my assistant, do some research and get a bunch of just pages and pages of research, and I sort of distilled it down. Uh, these numbers are really those that are sort of diagnosed. It's probably a bigger issue than what we see in diagnosis, but this is what came through in a recent study, that about 40 million people in the United States, about 18% of our population, experience an anxiety disorder in any given year, 18%. It's almost one out of five people that you would encounter, that you would interact with. And, and it's, probably, it's most certainly higher than that, but that's what's diagnosed. Um, about 8% of children and teenagers experience an anxiety disorder, and, and that seems to be climbing, and that seems to be probably more than that as well, but that's what's diagnosed. The World Health Organization shows that this is a global issue because one out of 13 people globally suffer from anxiety. And people say, well, well where does it come from? What's the source of it? And it's really multifaceted. Uh, it can be genetics, it can be brain chemistry, it can be personality, it can be life events, and it's probably in most cases a combination of lots of different things. But it's a very, very real, real issue. It's considered the number one mental health issue in North America right now is anxiety. And then, Ramel did some research on uh, the impact of technology and specifically focusing on screens as much as we do, Looking, staring at screens and for children and for teens. And, and I will take all the, all the research that, that I got to review on that and bring it down to one simple statement. 
spending lots of hours every day focusing on a screen, whether it's a phone screen or an iPad or a computer screen, if we're overly focused on that, it's not helping. And that's all the data kind of put into one simple statement, that that seems to exacerbate and to increase the problem. And, and, and so you look at that and you say, well, well what, what can be done? Is, is there hope in a world that's filled with anxiety, producing issues, and, 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 and you know, is it just, okay, we have to create an environment in our life where there's never any struggle and never any problems, and then we can have peace? Well, no, that's not the way life works. So I'm going to share three biblical insights for battling anxiety and worry. Three kind of epic kind of concepts or ideas that if you'll get a hold of these and begin to live into them, I think you'll discover a movement of, of growing peace and decreasing anxiety and worry. And here's the first of those three things. Number one, prayer. It is the source of power and the path of intimacy. The greatest way we can begin to battle against anxiety and worry and fears and all those things is really going deep in prayer. Listen to these words. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. If you're on your app, just kind of open up Philippians chapter 4. If you have your own Bible, tuck your, your, uh, your bulletin in your Bible there because we're going to come back to this passage at the end of the message as well. So you want to mark that Philippians chapter 4. And I'm going to read just two verses, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, which is a kind of prayer, asking for God's help, asking for God's intercession, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, another form of prayer, giving thanks to God. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus, we live in a world with lots of challenges and lots of pain and lots of uncertainties. And there's not a person gathered in this room or in the family worship venue or online today who is not facing some kind of anxiety-producing struggle or who isn't walking with someone they love and care about who's facing that. So meet us in this time and speak to us. We pray asking for, we, we, we call out to you and say, God, help us grow more in peace and have less experience of anxiety and worry in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's the question. How can prayer unleash the power of heaven to overcome fear and anxiety? I mean, really? Just pray? That's the solution? Just praying? Well, it's never just praying. We believe there's incredible power in prayer, that there's a real God who really knows us and who's listening and who hears us and has power to act. But, but it's not simply praying. Prayer is about being totally honest with God. The thing that's beautiful about prayer is you can come to God and you can say, God, I'm terrified. God, I'm worried. God, I am anxious and my mind is just churning and my stomach is bubbling and I don't know what to do. Help me. And you might be able to hide your anxiety and worry from your spouse or your children or your friends or your boss, but God knows. So just tell him. Say, God, this is how I'm feeling and I'm struggling and I need your help. Even the process of acknowledging it and bringing it before God is part of that process of God beginning to heal. Just acknowledging it. And putting it out there. And then, to understand God's divine presence and peace, that when we pray, we're not just throwing up words to heaven. When we pray, we encounter God. We worship a God who is real and who is present and who is glorious and who loves us. So when we pray, he draws near to us. And there is peace in the presence of God. In those moments when you have, have sought the face of God and you feel the presence of his Holy Spirit come upon you, it's the spirit of peace. Now here's the key. All the things that created anxiety, in, the most, in most cases, they haven't changed or gone away. You say, well, I've, I've, got, I've got a kindergartner who's going away half day to school every day, five days a week now, and they're gonna be out of my home and I'm anxious about it. Well, they're still going to school. I got a kid who's off to college and they're 2,000 miles away. They're still 2,000 miles away. That hasn't changed. But when the presence of God's spirit, when you sense his presence with you, and when you become a Christian, when you come to the cross, confess your sin and receive Jesus, take his hand and follow him the rest of your life, the spirit of God moves in. And God's spirit brings peace. So when you pray, you have that sense of connection with God and his presence 
brings peace. And I would challenge you in prayer to find a quiet place to seek his presence and to seek his face. Find the, the more you're dealing with anxiety, find a quiet place and just sit or kneel or lay flat on your face or flat on your back, whatever's comfortable, just lay yourself before God. And if you say, I don't even know how to begin praying, then start here. Just say, Jesus. 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 Jesus, help me. Jesus, guide me. And just, and just begin to say his name. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ because he broke the power, power of sin and hell and death and he, he conquered and he rose again. And there's power in Jesus, amen? There is power. And so just even if it's, all you can say is the name of Jesus, there is peace and power in the name of Jesus. Make prayer part of your life. It, it won't necessarily change all of the circumstances, but it will bring peace that passes understanding. How can prayer connect you intimately to God so worry shrinks to its proper size? And this, this is what happens. When you get connected with God in prayer, circumstances may change over time, but they may not change over time. But your outlook changes because, because we look at things and they just grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and they seem overwhelming. And then we come into the presence of God and every, those things seem smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Why? Because God is massive and his power is massive and he is glorious and beautiful and he is on the throne. And, and so when we come into his presence, to his presence and seek his face, we connect with him and, and, and worry shrinks to its, uh, to its a proper size. We recognize who God is. As we're praying, we recognize as we interact with God who he is. He's the forgiver of my sins. You want to see, you want to see worry decrease? You get in the presence of the one who says, I have washed your sins away. They are gone. As far as the psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God has removed your transgressions from you. They're gone. They're thrown in the deepest ocean. You want to have peace? Understand that God looks at you and he says, I see no sin. And that brings peace. And then you start to see yourself and understand, yeah, I've made mistakes, a lot of them. I mean, Jesus died to pay for them. But I don't, those are not held against me by the only one who can truly hold them against me, and that's God. He's also the lover of my soul. When you pray, you understand, I am loved by God. And all of a sudden, that worry and that anxiety, I gotta find just the right woman who will really, that perfect woman who will love me. Or, I, or, or, or women, you say, I gotta find that perfect man who will love me. Well, first of all, stop looking. She doesn't exist, he doesn't exist. <laughs> perfect is the key. There may be somebody for you, but they won't be perfect, I guarantee you. They're human beings. But, but, but okay, well, then I'm awaiting the right person for me. Okay, but understand this, you are loved by God. So passionately, so deeply, so, with such glory, that that's enough to satisfy your soul for eternity. And then if God chooses to give that, that, that wonderful man or that wonderful woman and, and you're, you're, that you're waiting for, you say, well, I'm waiting to be loved, then God can pour his love, more love through them to you. But if you know God's love, you have what you need. And you stop being worried and anxious about the future because the lover of your soul is in your life. <coughs> I'm gonna fight through the little tickle in my throat here. Uh, you, you understand in prayer that God is the giver of amazing grace. That, that God's grace is sufficient and it's enough. And he gives that grace freely. And in prayer, you feel his grace come upon you and that brings peace. When you pray, you discover that he's the good shepherd of the sheep. And his rod and his staff, they comfort you. And he leads you beside quiet waters. Boy, another way you walk in peace is just letting the scriptures, reading the Bible. And I loved, I loved in the testimony on the video, just about just reading God's word. And so I didn't even know really what it meant, but God began to minister to me. And, and, and so we understand that God is our good shepherd. He's the protector of my life. Uh, as, as we go deep in, in prayer, we, we meet the God who watches over us, who protects us, and, and who, who, who keeps us safe. I remember when I, when I was uh, a, a new believer, I started reading the Bible, and I got to Psalm 139. And it, it impacted me so deeply. I started to read the Psalm, and it says, and if you know my background, I didn't grow up in the church. I'm reading the Psalm 139 for the first time. It wasn't a sermon. It wasn't a youth group. It was just me sitting in my room reading this chapter of the Bible. And it said, when you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. When I realized that the God who made me knew me in the womb of my mother and already loved me, and he knew my name, and he knew my future, and he knew my life, and he loved me already, that was overwhelming. 
And, and then in Psalm 139, it goes on to say, every day of your life is written in his book before one of them comes to be. That God knows my life. It's not random. There's no point where God says, oh, I didn't know that was gonna happen. He knows he's on the throne. Man, that brings peace. When we experience God as the protector of our lives, the good shepherd, the giver of grace, the lover of my soul, the forgiver of my sins, that brings peace. When you pray, you meet that God, and that God begins to bring peace into you, your life. But, but prayer is part of the journey. There's more. Here's the second thing. Biblical insights for battling anxiety and, and worry. And it is a battle. We have to enter into it. We partner with God in growing in peace. So here's the second thing. Identity. Who I am and whose I am. If you want to grow in peace and move away from anxiety, know who I am and whose I am. And, and so how do I know that? Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And just turn a little bit right in your Bible there. And just kind of look on, on your app, 1 Peter chapter 2. And I read, want to read a couple passages. This was one of the first passages in the Bible I memorized. I was 16 years old when I began to memorize the Bible. Somebody told me you should memorize scripture. I had some challenges in my life, so I ended up memorizing the book of 1 Peter. It was my first big chunk of the Bible that I memorized. And so I, I memorized, this was part of that memory process. And, and this helped define who I am. I, I was a brand new Christian, but I didn't grow up in the church, didn't know any Bible stories. Well, I was just reading my way through the Bible. And I got to this and memorized this. And this, this to, to this day, this tells me who I am and whose I am. 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 4. As you come to him, this is Jesus, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, that's us. If you come to the cross and receive Jesus, whether you're 16 or 66, it doesn't matter. You become a, royal, a holy priesthood. And then verse 9 continues and says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Listen to this. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy mercy. Who do we become through genuine faith in Jesus Christ? If you come to the cross, if you have already, or if one day, you're not a Christian, you say one day uh, you become a Christian, you come and you confess your sins, you receive Jesus Christ, his grace and his love, he takes your hand and he leads you all through this life and into eternity, you become his follower. If that happens in your life, here's what you become. You become part of God's church, his redemptive family changing the world with his love. You become part of a holy priesthood. You have absolute access to God the Father. You can walk right into the throne room of heaven and you don't have to even knock. The door's open. You don't have to go through a priest or a pastor or a rabbi or somebody who's better than you because you've been made clean and perfect in Jesus Christ. If you become a Christian, you are part of a royal priesthood and you have access to God Almighty. Some would say praise God. And that's the truth about you. That's who you are. That's whose you are. You become a chosen people, chosen by God. You become part of his special possession. He says, you are so precious to me, so special to me. You are the people of God through faith in Jesus Christ. When you know that, peace begins to come in because you begin to have an identity in Christ and not in what the world says. So here's the next question. How can knowing who we belong to decrease the power of anxiety? How can knowing that we belong to God and we are his chosen people, how can that decrease our anxiety and grow our peace? Because the world is telling us that we're measured by our fill in the blank. We are measured by the car we drive. We are measured by the neighborhood we live in. We are measured by this or that degree or diploma. We are measured by the clothes we wear. We are measured by our personal appearance. And it goes on and on and on and on. And there's just no way anyone measures up to all this stuff. My heart breaks for young girls in our culture who at 8 or 10 or 12 look in the mirror and they're these sweet, beautiful young girls. And what they see is, I'm fat, I'm ugly, because what they've been told is, this is the standard. And what they realize is, I'll never be this. And then God comes along and says, you are mine. You are my daughter, loved by me. You are my son, loved by me. And I call you precious, and I call you beautiful. 
if we're measuring ourselves by how the world measures things, we will never measure up to all the different standards, and they're always changing. Man, close styles right now change about every two to three months for young people. How do you measure up when you have to keep shifting to be in? And you say, no, no, God says, listen, you're in. You're in my family. You're in my heart. I love you. That's enough. That's enough. And so how can knowing who we belong to decrease the power of anxiety? Because when we understand that in Jesus Christ, if you can say, I am a child of God, I am a daughter of the king, I am a son of the king, I have been forgiven to the point of utter purity. There is no sin in me through Jesus Christ. Now there is in Kevin alone, but that's why Jesus died. And when I accepted him, he washed me clean. I am righteous in God's sight. I am made worthy of heaven, not because of anything I've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. Someone say amen. amen. That's the truth. So, so we come to God in prayer and we connect with him and that begins to bring peace and lowers the levels of anxiety. But we also say our identity. We have to know who we are in Jesus Christ. To say, I know who I am. I am loved by God. I am washed clean in Jesus Christ. I belong to him. Man, when I know that, then all the world's standards just kind of get washed away. I mean, that, that's... that's that's chump change compared to what Jesus says about me. Someone says, well, I don't like the clothes you wear. I buy the cheapest clothes that I can as infrequently as I possibly can. <laughs> I don't care. I get forced occasionally to buy something new just because, yeah, I guess, you know, it's, you know, whatever. But, um, but, <laughs> but I've been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I've been washed clean through him. And this, at the end of the day, does not define me nor where I live, nor all the other standards of this world. And when we get that, our identity, who we are in Jesus and whose we are, that God loves us, that changes us. That brings peace. But there's more. A third biblical insight for battling anxiety and worry is action. That we become partners in the peace process. We are partners in the process of growing in peace and walking away from anxiety. So here's the action. Stop it and start it. This is the action. Stop it and start it. Say that with me. You ready? Stop it and start it. One more time. Stop it and start it. There's some things we got to just stop because we're doing things that cause anxiety. We're creating our own problems. And we can start doing things that lead to peace. And we have to say, God, give me the strength and the power to stop doing the wrong things and start doing the right things. And we partner with God. So yes, we pray. And yes, we know our identity. But if I'm praying to God, and if I know my identity, but I keep doing massively anxiety-producing things every single day, guess what? I'm going to be anxious. We have to make decisions and partner with God. The Apostle Paul says this in Colossians chapter 3. Turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3 or just... Pop that in on your, your Bible app there and pull up Colossians chapter 3. Well, here's what I want you to notice. We're going to start in verse 8 in just a moment. I want you to notice how the Apostle Paul says, get rid of some things, stop certain things, actually take them off. It's like, almost like bad clothing. Take them off and then begin certain things, put certain things on. And watch this contrast that we're to be partners with God in getting rid of and stopping things, taking things off, and being partners with God and starting things and doing the right thing. Verse 8 of Colossians 3. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self and its practices. That's not everything. It's just an example of some of the kind of stuff we got to stop and battle against. And we're partners with God in this process. And then... Verse 12, it starts, you know, here's the things you should be doing. And therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, remember, you're chosen, you're loved, okay? But even chosen and loved, that's your identity. You still gotta work at some things. Clothe yourselves, put these things on. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Listen to this. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Wow, that's a challenge. And over all these virtues, put on love. Put it on every day, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then here's the capstone of the whole thing. It's about peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. So pray and know your identity, but also make a decision to stop some things and to start some things. Let me give you some examples. And all of these I could give more detail on, but I'm just gonna give you some quick examples. And here's what I wanna encourage you to do. Notice one or two stop things that you go, 
that's something I could stop and bring my life more peace. And notice one or two start things, and maybe say, that's something I can start doing and move or go more down the road, and it'll bring me more peace and lower my anxiety. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at the stops, all right? Here's the first stop. You ready for this? Stop spending money you don't have. Okay? You want to lower your stress level? Stop spending money you don't have. But then I can't buy everything I want. Exactly. You can't. And you shouldn't. But I have a plastic card that lets me. It just digs the hole in your finances and your life and your soul every time you buy something you can't afford. And you, you want to lower your stress and anxiety. Stop buying things that you don't have money for. It's a crazy thought, but give it a try. Here's the second one. Stop being lazy at work or school and trying to do the least you can. Don't be that person. That's, a, that's an anxiety-producing lifestyle. I'll do the least I can at work. I'll do the least I can at school. That's the way to live on the ragged edge and, and just to head down. A, it's just anxiety and worry. You do the best you can all the time. Not the best someone else can do, the best you can do. But when you give your best, it actually leads to peace and you're not so anxious because you're doing the best you can. Certain things you can stop. Stop telling lies to cover your tracks. If you've gotten into a pattern of like, like, okay, which lie did I tell this person? How do I, okay, I'm trying, always trying to remember who, what, what lies I told. Just start telling the truth. Much better than living in a world of lies. Stop doing things you know God does not want you to do. If you're doing something, you say, I know God doesn't want me to, but I just kind of keep doing it. Just stop, and that will lead to peace and lower your anxiety level. Stop cheating on your spouse. If you're cheating on your spouse, can I just say as a pastor and somebody who loves you, you want to lower your anxiety level? Stop doing that. Say, I don't know if I can get out of that. Talk with a pastor. We'll pray with you. We'll keep you accountable. But, but commit yourself to fidelity in that relationship. Stop wasting time on things that do nothing to make your life better or the lives of other people better. If you're investing massive amounts of time in things, it may not be a bad thing. It may be a neutral thing, but you just put so much time into it. You know, dial that back. Stop pouring all your time into things that really don't benefit your life and the lives of others, and you'll find peace and less anxiety. Stop watching so much bad news. How about that one? <laughs> he said, well, then I'm going to have to stop watching news altogether, maybe. Um, you know, limit yourself to like 15 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day. Seriously, don't, don't, don't have a media stream of bad news. Feeling. I don't know why I'm so anxious. It's like, oh, waves of anxiety-producing stories, right? Um, just don't fill your heart and your mind constantly with bad news. The other day I was listening to a podcast, and this is how conditioned I think we can become. On this podcast, they talked about the fact that, that crime in America and violent crime in America, and here's what they said, and this blew my mind. Crime in America and violent crime in America is dropping more dramatically than it ever has in history. And I thought, that's wrong. That's not true. It can't be true. You know why? Because all I hear, now it turns out that, that the... Um, stories on the media talking about violent crime have increased by 20%. But for the most part, violent crime has dropped by 50% in the last 25 years. Did you know that? I, I heard that and thought, that's not true. So I got online and I started doing some research. I just find some neutral studies that were done, national studies that were done. And so the things I'm going to mention now, we have some links on the, on the website. You can just go and pull up these studies. But um, overall, there's no evidence in America of a national crime wave. And I'm reading this going, this can't be true because all I've heard is how horrible the world is and how horrible America is. You know, crime has dropped significantly in the last quarter century. These are just highlights. In 2015, crime fell for the 14th year in a row. Fell. And violent crimes, including murder, have decreased by almost 50%. And there's more. It just, just goes on and on and on. And I'm reading this going, but it's, it's, all, it's all studies. And, I mean, and, and, I, and now they did say that there's certain pockets and cities in different places where violence is going up. But overall on a national level, you know, I'm living like this. Get in your house, lock the door, and get under the bed. <laughs> because someone's going to kill you tomorrow. I mean, you know, it's like, if you watch, and, and it doesn't mean that the world is, is perfectly safe and we don't have to be careful. But, but maybe, maybe there's good news. And when you hear that good news, look it up and research it. If it's good, share it with somebody. You know, the world's not necessarily all falling apart. There's things that are getting better. Praise the Lord. There's a lot of things we can stop. So don't stop. You'll stop spending too much time listening to bad news constantly. Stop fixating on what you can never change. If you spend a lot of time focusing on things that you have absolutely no power of changing, and you focus on those all day long, stop doing that. So I'll focus on what I can change in my life and in my family and in my neighborhood and in my community. We're doing involved in a lot of things as a community, as a church, to make a difference. In my nation, in my world, there's things I can make a difference. But if I can't make a difference, I can't just be stewing in that all day long. 
Because that just creates this anxiety. I can't do anything, but I think about it all day long. Certain things we can stop doing, but then we also have to start doing some things. How can growing a good and graceful lifestyle increase peace and drive worry away? What are some peace-growing patterns, some things you can start doing? Here's one. You ready for this? Write this. This will be good for some of you. Massive move towards peace. Start being five minutes early to everything. <laughs> Try it. Five minutes early to everything. For me, I'm driving somewhere. If I'm running late, it's like, what's wrong with you people? Come on, get out of me. You're so slow. And, I just, you know, and, and I've been working on this. So if I'm driving somewhere five minutes early, 10 minutes early, I'm, I'm, like, I'm just driving along like, <laughs> merge, you know. <laughs> You know, and it's like, you know, seriously, it's like, and the whole world has changed. What's changed? I'm just driving early. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, just, just make decisions, start doing the right thing, start being intentionally and surprisingly kind to everyone you interact with, surprisingly and intentionally. So you're checking out at the grocery store, and you're getting your, you're, you're all done, and then you pay, you, know, you pay your bill, and you look at the person, and you say, hey, Thank you so much. You make eye contact, human eye contact, person to person. Hey, thank you so much. Have a fantastic day. They're going to be like, whoa, what? Whoa. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. And people kind of freak out a little bit. It's like you're, look, you're looking at me. You're talking to me. You know, it's just, just a moment of kindness. Slow down for 10 seconds and express kindness. It makes a difference for them, for you, and it just brings a sense of peace. How about this one? Start exercising and eating better. Okay, next point. No. Um, <laughs> I'll be totally honest with you. This, this has been a lifelong battle for me. A, my whole family history, a massive lifelong battle. But when I'm exercising regularly and I'm eating better, my anxiety levels go down and my peace level goes up. And, and it's, pretty, it's pretty much true for most people. So look at, you go, you go, well, that can impact my peace quotient? Yes, it can and it does. So, so make those, you know, work at those things. Be a partner in the peace process. Start saying, I'm sorry as often as you need to, and actually mean it. Look for opportunities. If you're out of line, just really quick and say, I'm so sorry. That, that was, that's my fault. I, I apologize. It's amazing what it does to a relationship. There's people that don't know how to ever say they're sorry. Start, when, you're, when you mess up, and I don't, don't, don't make up things like, oh, I didn't do anything but sorry. You know, I mean, it's got to be real. But pl trust me, there's plenty of reasons for you to say sorry and plenty of reasons for me to say sorry. But when you step out of line, look at the person and say, I'm really sorry, I apologize, I'm going to work at not doing that anymore. That brings peace in your relational world. Start making weekly worship with God's people a higher priority. Make what we're doing right here. When you gather with God's people, when you slow, plug the, you know, kind of unplug from that crazy world, and you sing some songs of praise, and you open the word of God, and you hear a message, and you, and you spend time with other Christians. There's something about this that's good for our souls and brings a sense, a sense of centeredness and peace in the midst of a crazy life. Make this a higher priority in your life, and I think it will move you towards a greater place of peace. Start sharing what you have with others and with the God who gave it to you. Boy, you want to grow in peace, just take the things God's given and be quicker to share. Be quicker to be generous with people and with God and grow in generosity. Start looking for good news and celebrate it. Start looking for good news and celebrate it. And actually, I'm gonna put these on the website, but I had heard recently that, that world hunger, extreme poverty, and, and absolute poverty, and world hunger is dropping the fastest it's been in all of human history. I'm not gonna show you, I've got three charts that I can put on the website. But I, again, I heard that and thought the world, the world is, that people are being lifted out of extreme poverty faster than any time in history. And I thought, that can't be true. I thought, that's not true. Then I started doing research. It's true. It's incredible. Could we be happy if something good happens in our life, in, in our world? And, and, and now there's still a lot of people in poverty, and we got to still, Shoreline's involved with individuals on a community level, a national level, and a global level on helping people. And we'll keep doing that. But when things are going well, can we just say, praise the Lord. Thank you. And we should rejoice in those things and notice those things. Start doing what I can to help others. Identify what I can do and do my part to help others. And then one more. Start taking your next step by getting the help and the support you need. For many people, they're gonna say, boy, I'm praying to God, and I know my identity, and I'm stopping the wrong stuff, I'm starting the right stuff, but man, I'm stuck, and I deal with some really deep issues of anxiety. Man, if that's the case for you, get, you know, get with a, a, you know, a trained Christian counselor, talk with one of our pastors, and we know how to refer you to the right people, and connect you to the right people. And then today, 
you know, get in a support, get in a network of people that can help walk with you through. You don't, don't go through your anxiety-driven, worry-filled, difficult time alone. Don't do that. Walk with others. So today in our courtyard, there's a booth that has our care ministries. We have a lot more care ministries than the ones I'm going to list, but here's the four that are featured today. Grief share. If you've got a deep time of loss, you've lost a loved one or a deep time of loss, that's a group that gathers to talk about that and walk through grief together. Divorce care, if that's been a loss in your life of divorce, a, we have a ministry for that. Lay counseling, we have a team of people. It's, it's a free service we offer to anybody in the community. And, and they can come and we have, we, Shoreline has offices for the lay counseling center off campus so there's privacy. And we have trained people that Dennis and a whole skilled team have equipped and trained over the long haul and they're ready there to offer lay counseling. Now, if they look and say, oh, what you need is professional counseling, they'll refer you. But sometimes what you might need is somebody to talk and pray with who can give you wisdom along the way. And then our mental health ministry that's just developing. It's just, I think we're two meetings or two weeks into this new ministry. And say, boy, I think I have to deal with some mental health challenges. We've got a ministry for that too. If you say, man, I'm stuck and I want to take a step forward and I'm, and I'm being prayerful and I know my identity and I'm trying to do the right things, but it's, I'm just stuck. Man, we've got people to come alongside of you. That's what we do as Christians. We walk with each other. I want to read this passage one more time and just remind you of the hope that we find in Jesus. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, there are many people here today who, who battle with and struggle with lots of worry and anxiety and fears and things that just keep their lives churning and their, their stomachs bubbling. And I just pray that, that we would find in prayer a solitude and a connection with you in our identity that we would know who we are and whose we are. And I pray that you would give us the strength of your Holy Spirit to stop doing the things that, that are perpetuating anxiety and we would start doing the things that lead to peace. Let us be partners with you, God, in the peace process for our own lives, for those around us, and also for people we love and we care about. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.